like an artist, you see them on MTV, whatever, you get their CD, you listen to their CD, you memorize their CD, you go to their concert, and you go, yeah, and you go, that was great. That is so boring. Go to an all-night event that is in a different location every time that, you know, there are crazy lights and mass numbers of people and two turntables and a DJ, and everybody is a participant, and they all make up the energy that becomes the party. Thousands of kids come out, they dress a certain way, they take certain drugs, and they empower themselves in certain ways, and it's not about rock and roll. It's about bringing people together, and it's about, you know, creating this instant feeling, this oblivion, this, like, particular one-night oblivion where nothing else outside that room matters. I went to this one club one night NASA and it was just a totally different sound. It was like everything that everybody was listening to, like all the drums were like in the treble range, it was like chicka chicka ta chicka chicka ta And like the bass was like one sine wave and it didn't break, the bass didn't go like boom boom boom, or like ooh. And it was just like such a new sound that I was like, oh my god, this is it. My name is Craig Bones from uh, Brooklyn, New York, and I guess I represent a lifestyle as DJ, I guess, meaning, you know, I DJ for a living. The whole thing about the rave scene is that it's not about what I do, it's about the whole culture as a whole. So basically, I play my part in playing the records for the people. This is my life. I wake up in the morning, I eat, I sleep, I shit techno, house, the culture, whatever it is, but I never shut it off for five minutes, you know, I don't, it's always going on and always looking to play new records. I started writing songs and I bought some drum machines and from there it's just uh, in a matter of three years it, it all happened, you know, I was making records and people in London that were doing these parties were playing my records and somebody took the, you put the phone number on the record, somebody called up, you want to come to England? I was like. I'll go to England, you know, I didn't believe it. And he's like, yeah, you're gonna play to 5,000 people. And I'm like, 5,000 people? When we got to the site that night, it was about two months after that, there was cars for miles. I was like, 5,000, there's gotta be like 10,000 people here. When I got up on the stage, there was 25,000 people and the sun was first coming up and that's when I went on. Just to have the control of 25,000 people at once on a sound system, I, it, it, it's just changed my life. My father was murdered in 1985, so he drove a cab and he got, you know, he got shot behind the wheel. I think that's another reason why um, my passion for music was even stronger because he was my main inspiration. When I was young, he he just had a massive record collection. We're like these guys, oh, I'm trained in piano. Now I didn't even train in nothing. I just heard my father with records. He had very underground stuff, um, south of the old South Soul records. Uh, I mean, from the ver inception of disco, when the hustle came out and became big in 75, I just, you know, I always knew the music from them. I still have all those records. No, it's original, exactly how it came out on the uh, Paul Winley 12 inch. I always explain it like, in the movie Saturday Night Fever, he, he crosses the Brooklyn Bridge, gets into Manhattan, and the movie's over. Well, you know, I kind of did the same thing. We have the store here in Manhattan, but I don't know, it's not a movie to me. It's just everyday life. <laughs> I 
just want to make sure that everybody's prepared if they haven't gone to one before, that they know what they should bring and what they should have together. Swiss Army I don't give a fuck what happens to me attitude. <laughs> Let's see, some essential, essential rave party things that you might want are, first of all, water. You have to have water, always be hydrated, and uh, no alcoholic beverages, fruit juice, soda, water, water. Water, Swiss Army knife, a shovel, really works good. You're getting yourself out of there. Ready? Ready? You want to wear something that you don't need to hold on to, so you're free to dance. Backpacks work really well, it's convenient. Um, wear comfy clothes so that you can get dirty and feel comfortable to dance and sweat. These are um, love pops. And you want to bring enough to share with all your friends and for all the new people you're going to meet. One time we brought these flashing rings and everybody warm so we could find each other in the dark. You're not going to want to leave without your sunglasses because in the morning when you come out, it's going to be daylight and you're not going to look pretty. I would hope that I wouldn't find my daughter or her friends in a place like this. Mm, you know. What do you think about the raves? Kind of, I'm impressed. I mean, it's like something it? new, uh -huh. and you get into the music. You do get into it. Why do you think that is? The beat, the lights, I don't know. garage that we could illegally convert into a studio. We needed noise cover, right? So right in our backyard is the 210 freeway. So when we're playing music like really, really loud, 3 o'clock in the morning, you can't tell. Is that kick drum or is that the diesel that just went by, you know? We want to know, the trick is to get two different thicknesses of of uh, drywall. What's it called? Sheetrock? Sheetrock. Sheet we were completely inspired by the parties that we'd go to. We were inspired by the whole, uh, the, the energy that, the positive energy that came from these parties and, and that no matter if you were black, white, Hispanic, Asian, you, everybody got together and everybody had a good time. I mean, well, I think we left many a night and, wa and went home and, and, and were inspired to do something at, on a studio. So that was, that's something that was played by hand, just, you know, with the Jupiter 6, because right. that involved using a, a, the pitch band wheel to modulate the, the filter frequency. This is called a woolen sack. We call it the swollen sack. It's tube and analog. Totally awesome. You can run it at really super slow speed, which gives you this really great bottom. And then we just totally overload the signal until this really cool light comes on. 
Well, you know when you see the cool light that we're going to get a good sound. So, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to tell your parents. They're in a band called The Crystal Method. I was the one that told your parents what the name of the band was, though. Oh, yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> accidentally. So, what are they called? What do you guys call yourselves? I told my mom, and and I'm like, and we were, like, going for, like, a nature walk or something, with, and I'm like, uh, yeah, we're called The Crystal Method. And she looked at me, and she's like, we kept walking, and, oh, I guess that, that makes sense. That's what all the kids are into nowadays. <laughs> Um, okay. <laughs> it was one of the things that kind of intrigued us about this house when we when when we saw it was the uh, was a little bomb shelter we had in the front. We were thinking, oh, we could put an amp down there, or we maybe or if it's big enough, we put our studio down there. We had all these wild dreams, and then we, we the, the landlady, she was like, oh, I wouldn't go down there. I haven't been down there since like '76, and when my boy used to hide silver coins from his grandmother, and I'm like, Geez, whew. This is what we pulled up from uh, the bomb shelter out in our front yard, and uh, it's a family radiation detector kit, and uh, this is called a dosimeter. It's how badly you've been dosed with, <laughs> with radiation. It's... <laughs> function of house was dance and for me my interpretation of acid house was to take that further and make it psychedelic and celebratory and and positive beyond just music but I just had this feeling that there was something some kind of ritual trance music that could be long time based and ecstatic on Sunday August the 10th 1986 we were in Chicago and I was doing a radio show and so I basically got them to wire all the different separate rooms in the college radio together so I could use all the turntables all the cassette players and all the microphones and while we were doing that uh, this young enthusiastic black guy called Derek Carter turned up and he said oh you've got to go to this shop I know this shop you're gonna love it and Derek May was on playing spinning on two turntables while he was also the checkout guy he said, what are you looking for? And I said, well, I want the weirdest that you've got, the stuff that you can't cope with. I'm only interested in something that's so strange right now that none of us quite get it. And he said, oh, OK, you want the acid stuff? I said, yes, the acid, you know, it, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and over in this little rack were about four 12-inch white labels. And then I put them in a bag, and when I went back to England, I put them on. What I heard immediately was just that the rhythm, that speed, was the missing kick, the missing link to me. I went, oh, okay, that's it. It's not psychedelic enough for my taste, but the way that it, that this, this kind of hypnotic beat, this simplified beat, that's it. That's what we need, and that's the same speed as the trance music all over the world. It just all went together, whoop, like that. We recorded Superman. Turn on, tune into the Acid House which it turns out was the first 12-inch inch single to have the words Acid House on the label and be released as that, although the, the phrase was floating about or it, it took off in the United States and its notoriety in and of itself of it being banned and of it actually being about acid openly. When most people were going, oh, no, no, that's just a term, we were going, no, 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 it is about acid and psychedelics. We are talking psychedelic experiences. You know, we're pro this. We're not trying to pretend it's something else. Mm -hmm. started doing stuff it was like all the really product rip y stuff that was really popular because I mean so much of sort of like the culture at the time was to, I mean it's like influenced by like the whole idea of like sampling you know we were sampling you know visuals and making them our own this whole business this was like a bazooka Joe comic right and we like scanned it in and we just changed the bubble so it's really cool and then we put this NASA thing here because we made it look like a club because it's like this moon base on the moon but now it's our club. If you take something 
like a, a corporate logo or you take a piece of, of commercial art or television and then you cut it up and reassemble it in a very real way you're also emasculating its power over you <laughs> We do graphic design for everything from party flyers to records to posters. Basically, that feeds into all, all our other projects, whether we're throwing a party or whatever. But we also run a record label out of here. So where's the location going to be? I uh, can't disclose that yet, but it's going to be in Manhattan. Um, we usually, every party we've thrown, we have never put the location on the flyer. You go to some place and be a warehouse, you wouldn't hear anything and you wouldn't see anybody. And then you go through this fence and you meet some guy and he... You give him a couple of ten bucks or whatever, and he tell you to go back here, and you go walking through this alley, and you go through, a, you know, another alley, and then you hit this door. The rave scene, when we started throwing parties, the whole thing with rave was you broke into a warehouse, or you went and you took people and music to a place where it's never been, like an abandoned warehouse that hasn't had life in it for 20 years. You put a sound system, you put people in there, not bringing it into clubs or glamorizing it as the new club craze. Because the rave scene, when we started throwing parties, and on the West Coast, East Coast, wherever it was, it was anti-club. You go into the field, you know, approximately, it might be over there somewhere. And us as a band, even, we didn't know where to go, so we had to stop the van every five minutes, see if we could find any bass drums going on in the distance and finally you know we sort of found our way to the gig the directions kind of led us astray but you know after about an hour later we're here is this the road we came in on come on dude go 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 how long did it take you to get here like 12 hours why are this distance i've traveled is seven and a half hours the longest i've ever traveled is like 10 hours anywhere from <laughs> half like an hour hours. till eight hours uh, i'm from west palm beach florida just came up yesterday and I wanted to see what New Jersey was about. It's not the destination, it's the journey. It just gives you an excuse to get in your car and drive 800 miles, that's all. See the world, you know, see what's out there. Don't just sit at home and watch TV, go someplace. The DJ audience relationship is, again, it's like a symbiosis, you know, it's a biological structure, you know, I mean, it's like you are sending out information and pulses that the crowd, in a way, then sends back to you, and like, you, you, you're you like a focal point of, of the energy of these gathered people. I'm extremely idealistic, and I also try and really take the crowd someplace and like show them shit. I love the idea of continuous sampling, like remixing everything as you go. So writing is like that vision. Just like you're probably going to do edits and cut and splice when you're, when you're editing this tape. I mean, you do that with language even when you're speaking. You always are picking and choosing what words you're using, what, you know, what, what way you're going to describe something. So it, everything is a mix. I'm mainly a writer. The DJing, to me, I, every DJ is a writer. You're using the urban landscape as your book, as your novel, as your text. So everything is, is writing. To me, sampling is like ancestor worship in a way. It's like you're, you're reconfiguring, again, the records that somehow stuck in your memory. And like you want to you wanna take those records and do your own take on your own memory. My dad died when I was three, and he left me a whole bunch of records. You know, he was a really big jazz uh, aficionado. Well, he was a lawyer and um, defended the Black Panthers. I just grew up having this whole archive of records and books that he had left me, you know, and they were kind of ways of, of like, dealing with the death of my father, but, like, kind of learning out who he, who he had been, you know, through his record collection. My degrees were in philosophy and French lit. 
uh, but I, I kept seeing more and more with the music stuff that I was involved with that it was a lot more fun and actually a lot more engaging and dynamic than a lot of the philosophy stuff in a way. Philosophy is about ideas, music is about ideas to me, so it was a way of just trying to like bring the two together. <laughs> They would impound some of my sound system. They would lock me up over the weekends so I don't do any of the parties. I would be surveyed and followed everywhere. Um, I would have county court injunctions uh, against me not to go into specific areas. Um, I would have my house raided for, to, to, because they thought that the DJs were selling drugs. I've been at parties where the cops have just come in and thrown the power. And it's not right because they just walk in, they see a whole bunch of kids, they think we're out of hand, they shut it down, but they really don't know what's really going on. I think it just scares them. Like, you know, you see, you know, a thousand 18 year old kids on the street at 8 o'clock in the morning, it's like, you know, looking like freaks. It's pretty scary to, like, you know, Joe, white guy, policeman, who's like 50 years old, and, and uh, I, I think it scares them to death. They tried to shut down the party at the federal building because they thought there was bombs bombs in the bass bins, that the bass frightened them. They thought something was wrong with the sound system. So if you have people gathering for whatever reason in one place in a semi-legal way, which means that they have a different bond and they've already chosen to step outside the rules of those in control, then you have a, at least a potential breeding ground for alternate ways of being and a refusal to accept that imposed from above. like a kid again when I was a little kid. I don't need to get dressed real nice or anything. I don't have to impress nobody. It's just a little, my little toys I play around with. Uh, this is a of batteries. I put it on the floor and I dance. <laughs> everything you wanted to know you learned in kindergarten that that guy wrote be nice you know play fair hold hands crossing the street like whatever it is like we are just keeping some of that you know and you know growing up doesn't mean you know becoming a jerk When I was in school, I never really had a focus point. It was more of a, I was being associated as a troublemaker because my energies were either being, you know, targeted as someone, you know, who was a nuisance. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I didn't want to read a book which told me about A, B, C, and D. But I got thrown out of school and I stumbled into a building which I called the Basement Project. And um, this place was like an environment which took people like myself and gave us the option. I didn't have money to be able to buy equipment. And they, they bought a drum machine, they put it in front of me and said, yeah, here you go. And that's when I decided to use the machine and to learn, educate myself about the language of, you know, making music through, you know, computers. Front row, can I say? Wait for the signal, wait for the signal, wait for the signal. Step to the rhythm, step to the rhythm, step to the rhythm, and down some
Well, in hip hop, what they would do, they have two turntables and a mixer, and take the instrumental break where the record is, you know, just rolling along, and then bam, it just breaks down to just drums. Then they would just take two of the same copies and using the crossfader to extend the instrumental break. Just by just by extending the drum section so the MC could rap on top of it. And that's what attracted me to, to live drums was the was the break beat. being independent is all about. Yeah, where are your roadies? It's about heavy lifting. We, we're not a glamour boy band, Jesus fucking Christ! <laughs> we lift our own stuff! <laughs> it's like this, it's a whole do-it-yourself concept. It always was, it always will be. In terms of punk, it's just like anybody can pick up a guitar and play. Well, now anybody can pick up a, a sequencer and play. When digital technology became cheaper and accessible, it enabled all of us to be able to go out and for like not many pounds or dollars to be able to buy a tiny little studio setup and start recording yourself and techno music in a sense when it really kicked off maybe seven or eight years ago really empowered people again empowered a lot of young kids to be able to put their own records out and ignore the major labels and think we can press two thousand white labels and sell them in a week i can make a track you know stoned in my underwear on my you know on my bedroom you know and it could sound ten times better than like fucking you know a hundred thousand dollars worth of like studio equipment and studio time and professional musicians can sound because I can make a sampler sound that good too you know and it's like it, that scares people the origins of punk which is, I was fortunate enough to be hanging around as well there was a an enthusiasm for taking back the means of production I think with techno, we're actually, we're seizing the means of perception as well. practiced three little uh, songs for the very first German uh, TV appearance. We uh, made a session in the rehearsal room and uh, there was an original drum set, a very old one, very damaged, not very nice to play. It was not fun, yeah, but I had to do my work and uh, suddenly I, had, I found a little box inside of one edge of the room and there was only, only written waltz and beat and slow fox beat one and beat two. That made me interested and said, what is that? And Florian said, that's a rhythm machine, very old one, old fashioned, but one of the first, it's, it runs automatically. You only can choose the volume and the tempo. And I said, please connect it to an amplifier. And it was boom, chuck, boom, boom, chuck, boom, boom, chuck, only that inside, you know, very little childish sounds. And I said, it would be nice to play them only one by one, not the automatically things. And so you can do that. On top of that, there are some buttons, you know, you might boom, boom, nothing else was inside. And I said, that's crazy. So I don't have to sweat anymore, you know, because drumming normally is a, is a strong work. I was sitting there only on the little machine like boom, 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 boom. Oh, crazy how it is. And can we make some effects on it? And we had a small uh, echo tape, you know, echo a German uh, company. And suddenly it made, it had a space. It made boom, 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 cha, 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 you know. I said, this is crazy. This is good, you know. Everyone was interested. And uh, Ralph, or maybe Florian, said, can we use that instead of an original drum? So this is boring now, this is mid-age, throw it away. Within three days, I, I built with another friend of mine that very first drum pad on, on, on a wooden plate with 
I think, uh, six or eight uh, round-shaped metal plates connected by wires to uh, small metal sticks to play it standing up like very elegant, you know, without sweating. I'm Heather Hart, and I own Sonic Move Records along with Frankie and Adam. And I'm a DJ, and I make music as well. Personally, like, I don't use any computers. The equipment that I use and that I collect is analog. It's very warm, it's a very fat sound, and uh, you just can't get that out of the newer machine. It's a really underground scene also, and that's like, that's the heart of it. That's where the innovations come from. So we will create a sound, and then by the time it reaches the masses, and the masses are getting really into it, we're already on to the next thing, and that's what they might get into later. And that's what techno music is all about. It's about the constant change, and I think that's why the major labels haven't been able to grasp it yet. Rave culture is supposed to be the underground thing going on. Whilst, I mean, if you go to a real rave, there's 20,000 people there. You cannot possibly call that underground anymore. Berlin's Love Parade, when there's 1.5 million people, was, uh, was an amazing sight to see. To me, selling out, is it's not about making money. It's just selling selling what you believe in to all the peoples and then not like following up on that like if you believe in something really strong and you can make money on it that's cool but if you start working with these other companies and they start like making you mutate into things that you don't believe in then you're a sellout so Ronnie you're selling out selling out I hope I am because damn if I walk to a record shop and see my records on the shelf still I must be doing something wrong you don't have to fuck over people to survive because that's what makes us sick about the real world and about the way that it operates is that people screw people over every day in the name of business or in the name of you know, manifest destiny. There is an implicit politics to the rave scene that um, people are living their lives in ways which are basically unsatisfactory to them. They're not enjoying their lives, they're not having fun, they're feeling alienated from other people, they don't feel like they have a community. And that people go out to raves and they find, or better yet, are making some of the things that are missing in their everyday lives. You know, I think we're doing what the bigger difference is, is that we're trying to make our own network mm -hmm. that isn't exactly working for a big company, you know, doing such and such a thing, but we're working for each other. As far as I'm concerned, I've made it. <laughs> you know, I'm doing music and I'm not holding out a day job. I've made it. I'm not out there trying to get the Mercedes Benz or like the whatever, whatever. That's, that's all luxury items on top. It's not the thing. And there's this constant and increasing pressure in this world to think that the, the apparently material side effects are the actual process and they're not. To me, my idea is like MTV Unplugged. You unplug the TV from the wall, you put in your favorite mixtape, not my favorite, not Frankie Bones, it could be anybody. Put the mixtape in, put it on, and there you go. MTV Unplugged for 90 minutes, that's the show. if you're going to be raving. Um, if you're going to be raving, you shouldn't be doing dust, you shouldn't be doing K. Tripping on E, listening to the music, feeling the vibes going through your body. You know what I'm saying? It's like this absolute, just like, happiness that I didn't even know existed. And it's like, I just feel this closeness with people that I didn't know you could feel. And it's like, it's like everyone's just like on the same like 
level almost. Like everyone's like thinking the same thing. Like you can look at somebody and you just like know. You like just look into their eyes and you just know they're thinking like the same thing. Let's go back to you know indigenous cultures, to the ancient civilizations. You know shamanistically, you know it was part of the ritual you would take. You know there were certain drugs that would open up certain levels of consciousness. So when you surrendered yourself into the dance, into the ritual, into the collective organism, you have this. You're opening yourself up. It's just, it's just, it's just key. You should Especially do it too. Here, dude, you you should do it. Everything you want. Whether it's all about drugs or not, it is a safe place to use them. And that's why I have fun. I come here and I get fucked up. I mean, I can't, you know, it's no fun doing that at home. They've got all the stimulation, the lasers, the video, the sound. It's, it's, if you're gonna do that shit, this is the best place to do it. We took a small <laughs> sampling of hallucinogenic drugs just to see if they'd work. Are they? Not really, no. I've, I don't do drugs. I don't do drugs and just, you know, standing next to the speakers, feeling the vibe and all that sense of vibration, you know, it gives you like this natural high. The music, the trance, non-stop gives you this natural high and, you know, nothing could beat that. I had two cousins that were ravers. Uh, one died of an overdose um, coming home from a rave. He went to his room, fell asleep, never never woke up. I've seen kids drop dead in front of me, you know, and it's not a pretty thing. It's not a pretty thing to see somebody flopping around like a fish dying in front of you. Don't mix drugs. Not good. This is called poly drug use, and they don't sell for one drug. They take uppers and downers and the combination, and it uh, really wreaks havoc with your body. The nervous system is giving two contrary signals, and there are several people a week now being taken into mental hospitals with absolute nervous collapse because they mix speed, cocaine, and ketamine. One of the kids who died and was brought back to life from GHB drank 12 beers and popped a handful of Dexatrim. You know, there's no law that you can put on the books that's going to prevent somebody from doing something that dumb. I think now the focus is on just people hearing about this, the media hype, you know, like, you know, drugs and this and that, and, you know, the kids come out and it's really not cool because they're not getting into it for the right reason. It's almost like the media kind of reinforces what it's complaining about in a sense. Yeah, no, definitely. Absolutely. It's almost I mean, the media like it's telling 14-year-old kids, if you want to get fucked up, go out to a rave, totally. you know, and then all this, the screw-ups go out to our parties and then wreck right. our parties and they're like, oh, look at all the dumb ravers on drugs. It's like, wait a minute, yeah. you were telling them that that's where they should go if they want to be on drugs. Their, their parents read right about from. it in Newsweek and said to them, you're not going to these parties, are you? Well, they are now. People do drugs everywhere, and there's a, just as much a percentage of people doing drugs at a rock concert or a, a football game or an opera or wherever. There are people do drugs, and if they want to do drugs, they're going to do them whether there's a warehouse party or not. Don't just get hooked on the key, you know. It's just this. Once the door is open, you can get there. You can cross the bridge, you know, by yourself. It used to be just an E-based thing, and then people realize, oh, actually, if you just dance yourself up without the E, you still get that spiritual stuff, provided you let go. It's hard to stay awake. I'm really tired right now, but it's better than being cracked out on drugs. I mean, I would be up for, I remember one time in California being up for like seven days and looking in the mirror saying, who the fuck are you? We're both from New York. He used to eat all my drugs. The dog? Yeah, we were both, um, if the dog was skinny and I was skinny, you know, we were on drugs. <laughs> But we've been through it all together, and we're now we're here in Hollywood together. This is How sneakers. Like he loves it, but he needs to get laid. I had convinced myself that the drugs were, were, were necessary, and they're not. Mm -hmm. the, the music that I've, I've, I've produced without the influence of drugs, I dare you to listen to it on drugs. I don't want to be a preacher, because I love drugs, you know? But you can't do it forever. <laughs> I was born in El Salvador, Central America. And a week later, my mom went to Hawaii. I'm a bastard child. And um, my mom uh, renamed me after a bastard prince. Who is? Prince Kiyoki, who was King Kamehameha's son. When I moved from Hawaii to the mainland, I um, took a course, technical college, a little backtrack here, so that I can learn how to use computers and trace lost baggage. Huh. So I, I did the course in Ontario here, and then they had job placement. And I got this out of an ad in the newspaper in Hawaii. I then went to, the only place they were hiring was TWA in New York. So I said, fine. You know, I had $200. Psh, 
I, I was rich, I thought. You know, it's like, cool, I'll go there. I was working as a busboy at a club called Dance Cheerio. They wanted me to DJ one night for $50 a night, but I'd have to, you know, like, call in sick at my other place. I got really frustrated thinking, how, how can I possibly make a living DJing, throwing records on? I mean, it was like, to me, getting paid for it, it was ridiculous, and it is ridiculous, but it's not ridiculous within the context of who's making the money. What's really interesting is the first single I put out for Moonshine was called Caterpillar. And I called it Caterpillar because everywhere I went in the world, I'd be in Iceland, I'd be in Tokyo, I'd be in uh, Singapore, I'd be in Australia. These kids would be doing this little dance, like, you know, tripping out with a little... And I was like, whoa, you all look like little caterpillars. And it dawned on me that the whole world was doing this, and it wasn't like the twist or the hustle where you learned it. It was instinctual. Hey, my name's BT, and I make organic electronic music, is how I like to describe it. My whole kind of trip is, is like just about everything that I do on my records is generated by something organic, whether it's my hands, somebody else's hands, a mouth, you know, um, the cicadas in the woods, whatever it is. You know what I mean? That um, it's generated by something natural. I have a headset that's a dual hemisphere electroencephalograph made by a company called IBVA, and what it is is. Um, it's a dual electrode brain scan machine. It reads your brainwave activity. So I'll wear this while I'm working on music a lot of time and scan my own brain states and um, see what, it, what the kind of states that it puts you in when you're making music. One of my um, sort of hobbies is I've done a lot of research on photic and auditory driving, which are, um, which are two really interesting, naturally occurring things that happen in loads of different indigenous music. It's continual stimuli of a certain frequency, and it's always very small frequencies. And what people do is they entrain to the, that particular brain state um, that they're being stimulated with, uh, either by photic flashing or by auditory sound. Um, this goes back to, I mean, like, um, ind indigenous rituals performed by shaman in the Peruvian Amazon and stuff, they would beat a drum at a certain number of wave, wave cycles per second, usually four to six wave cycles per second, which is um, in brain state, which is theta brain state, which is a very creative brain state. And um, then they'd have someone else, while the shaman was beating the drum, flaming, um, you know, fanning the, the flames on a fire at the same time, in the same, at the same speed. And people would all eventually entrain into this brain state in modern club culture and in seeing modern club events and modern rave events and things like that, you're seeing people in train to the same brain state. You've got strobes, you have lighting that everyone's taking in, you have big time photic driving, and the music is auditory driving. That's why people get so excited at a rock concert and tear up the seats. It's nothing to do with the fact they like Elvis. It's because their metabolism is being governed by the bass and the rhythm and the light. And that's what it's all about. And that's what's interesting with rave and techno culture is it has reduced down in the West for the first time what is so-called popular music and youth culture to a ritual which admits to and utilizes the most arcane and ancient methods for achievement of altered states and a celebration of that contact with we otherness. Standing in the middle of a dance floor, even if you're, if you're on something or if you're not on something, I've had, I've had moments where I've just been overwhelmed. Like, you know that chilly, that chill feeling you get? Like the, the kind of like, you know, the overwhelmed sensation that something wonderful is going on. It 
definitely get your soul to a level that you can't reach just by, you know, being normal or being a regular person every day. After you're dancing for like 10 hours straight, you kind of tend to like transcend your normal capabilities. Before I was in the scene, I was a little punk, you know what I'm saying? I was a little gang member. Just, just like, I don't know, I was just a little hooligan, I was a little punk, but now it's like, I can walk up to anybody and totally be social, you know what I'm saying, be like, what's up, how you doing? And it's a good feeling to be able to be like that, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it makes me feel good to be able to go up to somebody without being a little punk and wanting to bite their head off. If you really want to change your life, I mean, it's like, you know, you get up, you do something in a day, and then you go to sleep, and then you're like, oh, you know, today sucked, but tomorrow's going to be another day. And then chances are it goes that same way, just again, like the last day, and it's like, you know, if you really want to break that pattern, don't go to sleep. You know, stay up all night. Find some place where somebody's going to stay up all night. Watch the sun come up. Just a, a suburban boy who hopes he'll see a nice girl and that's all he ever is consciously aware of he is still touching the divine and the 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 resonance and the reverberation of that and what it might illuminate we don't really know yet you can't put onto a cd bass bins rumbling through your guts at five in the morning and you can't bottle the feeling of just total euphoria, like when a DJ just brings you like to this level where you're just like totally out of your head. You should let go of all your inhibitions and dance your fucking socks off, because um, that letting go process will open you up.